Good. Well, welcome everybody um, to the Center for European Studies seminar um, with Professor Derek Penslar on his book, Theodore Herzl, The Charismatic Leader. Um, my name is Alexander Kay. I'm a professor of Jewish history and thought at Brandeis University, where I am the Stoll Family Chair of Israel Studies, and I'll be chairing the seminar today. I'm going to briefly introduce Professor, professor Penslar and then turn over to him. And um, Professor Penslar will be getting the set with um, his own introduction and summary of what he has done in this brilliant new book. Then he and I will have a conversation where I'll try to bring in questions that we have received by email from registrants over the past couple of days. And then we will have the final part of the seminar where we'll be able to answer um, questions and answers from you who are watching online. Um, so let me just first say a technical thing, which is that, especially if you're new to Zoom, I'd like to bring your attention to the bottom of the Zoom spring, uh, the, the Zoom screen, where there is a little icon which says Q and A. Um, if you press that, you'll be able to submit uh, a question and then we'll do our best to get through them um, when the Q&A session um, uh, takes place. So um, start thinking about your questions now and feel free to um, write them in that, in that form. Okay, um, Professor Derek Penzler is the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. And he's written very widely on many aspects of Jewish history identity in the modern period, including um, Jewish, uh, Jews in economics in modern history, Jews in the military, as well as many very important books and articles and chapters on the subject of the history of Zionism and the state of Israel. The book we are discussing today is his latest book. It is called Theodor Herzl, The Charismatic Leader. Um, it will unquestionably become the definitive biography of Herzl, one of the most important and well known in some ways, and yet certainly in other ways, the most enigmatic characters in modern Jewish history. And I'd like to turn over now to Professor Penzler to talk to us about his book. Thank you. First of all, I'd hope that everyone can see me and, uh, and hear me. All right. And if not, I'll probably get a little chat message. I want to thank, first of all, the Center for European Studies, Elaine uh, Papulius, uh, Vasilis Kutafaris, uh, Gilan Zeri, Peter Stevens. Um, without your help, this couldn't have happened. Thank you for the initiative. Thank you for the technical support. Uh, thank you for keeping CES going through this very difficult time. Uh, and thank you, of course, Alex, for taking time to, uh, to take part in this event uh, and, to, and to moderate. So um, I, I want to talk just a little bit uh, about, about the book. Um, well, the first thing really is why I wrote it. We have something like 200 books about Herzl of one kind or another. There's maybe 40 biographies of him, of which I would say a good eight or nine are serious academic uh, biographies. So the question is why, you know, why another book about Herzl? But we could say the same thing about Churchill or about Gandhi or Washington or Lincoln or any of the great leaders who have, um, who have led movements or countries that have made an impact on this, on this planet. The fact is that we need to have new biographies of individuals because the first rule of history is that everything changes. And the way we view the past changes, the way we understand the past changes. We have not had a, I'd say, a biography of Herzl that encompasses the entirety of his life since 1989. There has been books that deal specifically with one aspect or another of his thought, but a full-fledged biography has been a, been a while in coming. So that's one sort of overarching issue, but now let me go into it in a bit more detail, which is that um, biographies of great leaders tend to fall into one of two varieties. They tend to be hagiographic in the early era of a national movement or of a state, and then in time they can turn uh, a corner they can become revisionist and even adversarial. So in the case of Zionism in Israel, the early biographies of Herzl were hagiographic and they could be very good, full of interesting material, but they presented him really not as a full-blooded, complicated, 
human being, but as a, as a symbol. Uh, and then in the 1970s, as the state of Israel matured and the word post-Zionism first began to appear, which begins to appear uh, actually even earlier than that, but in the 1970s, it, some people start banding it about. And um, Herzl was a, a symbol of everything that people had glorified about Zionism. So then some people began to write about Herzl in a way that showed that he had feet of clay, that he was a flawed human being, and it's a way of being critical of Zionism and Israel themselves. So there was the great biography by Amos Salam uh, in 1975. And uh, another great biography, actually the best one uh, to date, 1989 by, by Ernest Pavel. So, uh, you know, the, the tension between hagiography and revisionism, my own sense is that we're now in 2020, and being in 2020, we can get past that adversarial versus hagiographic uh, dichotomy. And I'd like to uh, present Herzl in all of his complexity, but to show that his weaknesses, and he had many, and his flaws, and he had many, <laughs> were also a source of his strength and his greatness. So that's, I think, one major reason I wanted to uh, write the book, is to square, square that circle. I also wanted to write a biography that was 21st century in some of its fundamental assumptions. We all like biography. <clears throat> biography is probably the most popular user-friendly form of historical writing. But nonetheless, in the 21st century, biographies are more complicated than they were in the 20th because we're aware of the fluidity <clears throat> of human consciousness. We're aware of the situational uh, quality of the formation of human personality. A person is one thing in one situation and something else in a different situation. It doesn't mean that person is hypocritical or lying, or it simply means this is what it means to be a human being. Uh, so human beings are very much a product of situations, circumstances, they're fluid. I think the other term we use is hybridity, that our identities are much more hybrid and complex than we may have thought 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I wanted to write a biography of Herzl that although I do not specifically invoke a lot of postmodern theory, I, I don't do that at all in the book, I just tell a story. But I have in the back of my mind an awareness of these questions about what it means to be a human being and how our understanding of humanity as such has, has changed. So I wanted to bring that into the, um, into the book as well. And then just to be really honest, I wrote the book because I was asked to. Uh, the Jewish Lives uh, series at Yale University Press, which has been producing short interpretive biographies of major figures in, in Jewish history, asked if I would like to write this. And I thought, well, sure. But the catch with that is that I figured this would be a very easy book to write. Um, Herzl wrote material, which is easily available in published form. There are many good biographies of him. And I thought, well, this will be easy to sort of synthesize but then I realized how complicated it was, precisely because I was trying to carve out a new approach to him in terms of the hagiography versus uh, adversarial ethos, but also complicating issues about his personality. But there was something else that I only really came across when I got into the writing or the research. Uh, one is that writing about Herzl tends to separate him between Herzl as a journalist, that was his main his main livelihood. He, he never made a penny off of his Zionist activity. He was a journalist for, for, uh, for a living. There's kind of a separation between Herzl as a journalist and Herzl as a Zionist activist. And I realized that doesn't hold water. Uh, Herzl never stopped being a journalist when he was a Zionist and his Zionism infused his journalistic writings during the last decade of his, of his all too short uh, life. Another thing I realized working on the book is that um, even Pavel's biography, which is a wonderful book, doesn't use Hebrew sources. How can we, under, or Yiddish sources, how can we understand Herzl's appeal as a leader without understanding the people to whom he appealed? Eastern European Jews for the most part. And so I do write about Herzl, to be sure, but I also write about how people perceived him. And that gets to the book's major theme, which is about charisma. The book is called The Charismatic Leader. Charisma does not exist in a vacuum. Charisma is situational or dialogic. The fact that Herzl was handsome, well-spoken, 
had a fluent writing style, uh, extremely intelligent, and he was indefatigable. He had a great work ethic. These things are all important, but they don't really account for his charisma. Charisma is something that is constructed by an audience. And there was a certain kind of usually Jewish person, often Eastern Central European, but not only, throughout the world Herzl had adherents. It was a moment in late 19th century Jewish history when many Jews were looking for a charismatic leader. Anti-Semitism, poverty, persecution, assimilation, Jews were feeling that the traditional structures that had kept their identities firm, that had kept their lives, if not, uh, if not prosperous, at least they had some sense of predictability. Everything was up in the air. There was a need for a charismatic leader and along came Herzl. So the book is very much about Herzl coming into the world at a right moment. And I'll just talk very briefly about how this issue of charisma um, plays out in three of the major themes of the book, and then I'll, I'll stop. One is just about his own personal life, his psychological complexity. There is a psychiatrist at Tufts University named Nasir Gaimi, who wrote a book about nine years ago called First Rate Madness, in which he writes that great political leaders, charismatic leaders, are often troubled people. Now, it's not that all troubled people are charismatics, and not all charismatics are troubled people, but the latter is often the case. To be charismatic means to project a certain warmth or glow or energy that appeals to people. But it also contains within it, not always, but often, more than a hint of sadness. That the charismatic leader is someone who, who understands your pain, who understands your suffering, and who elevates you, who gives you hope and a sense of purpose. What this book wrote about as leaders like um, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, going back into the 19th century, who had this depressive, had a depressive aspect to their persona and actually helped make them more effective leaders. The best example of this is Churchill, who suffered from serious depression and who projected an air of, um, of, of not just confidence, but also of combining into his own persona all of the fears and the needs of, in his case, the British people. And Herzl was something very similar. But the charismatic also has something else besides that darker side. It's also just a hint of, of over-exuberance, enthusiasm, or to use a technical term, mania. Herzl did experience what, and I, I'm very clear in the book, I'm not a psychologist and I'm not trying to give him a diagnosis, but Herzl experienced something that appears to have been a manic episode in 1895, where he went for several weeks without sleeping, barely eating, writing scores of pages, hundreds of pages that would eventually become his pamphlet, The Jewish State. It's a time where he was writing at times things that were uh, sheer nonsense, truly mad. And yet he would then have utter a clarity of thought. And he would write something you know, quite, um, quite sage and, 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 and cogent. So Herzl experienced this period, it seems to have declined later in 1895, and I don't know of any other episode like it. Uh, but one thing he did write about explicitly, so I don't have to pretend to be a you know, psychologist, is he wrote about his depression. He, he was quite aware of his black moods and his sense of the uselessness of life. So Herzl the charismatic is a product, I think, of a complex personality uh, that knew great sadness and pain, uh, and loneliness. He was a lonely man, as great political leaders often are. He did not really have friends. He had one very close friendship when he was an adolescent. In his adult years, he had colleagues. He had uh, lieutenants, but he didn't really have friends. Herzl also had a very unhappy marriage. He couldn't really love the way that we would say a normal people could, could love. He didn't even really have the relationship with his children that many of us aspire to. I think he did love his children, but he was so wrapped up in his calling, his self-imposed calling to be a Zionist leader. He was very much an absent father. 
he lived for his own ideals. He lived for his movement. And in that sense, he had a lot of the qualities of a charismatic, a charismatic leader who was not really part of this world, not entirely a part of this world. So that's one of the themes in the book is how it's precisely the pain, uh, the depression, the exuberance or enthusiasm or mania, all of these things feed into the personality of a great political leader. But as Herzl himself was well aware, the line between being a great political leader and being a madman is, is, is a fine one. And he wrote about that. Uh, he, he knew what was going on inside of himself. So that's one theme in the book. Greatness is often contingent upon and very closely linked with various forms of uh, psychological complexity. A second theme then is how that charisma is communicated to or constructed by the Jewish world, which I mentioned earlier. People were looking for a leader. They found it in Herzl. Herzl had a gifted journalistic style. And he was a beautiful man. He was handsome. He had, um, he, he cultivated his, his appearance. He grew a, a thick beard when he was in his mid thirties. It was often referred to as an Assyrian beard. It gave him the look of a biblical prophet. But the main thing people noticed about Herzl was his eyes. Dark, sad eyes that communicated to his audience that he understood the suffering of the Jewish people. So Herzl cultivated a certain appearance, but it was also genuine. It's what he genuinely felt for all kinds of reasons. He was viewed by the Jewish world as uh, very much a Moses figure, uh, a prince of Egypt, raised in the court of Pharaoh, assimilated, uh, an assimilated Jew from Budapest and then Vienna, who in his mid thirties, after pursuing a career as a playwright and a journalist, and a very good journalist, by the way, um, has an epiphany and discovers that the problems of anti-Semitism, which many Jews in Vienna and Budapest were well aware of, Herzl believes that the only way to solve these problems is through the construction of a Jewish homeland. And most probably he, he decides in the ancient land of Israel. Uh, so Herzl is embraced precisely because he was so foreign, like Moses. There, there's something about the prodigal son, which is a Christian metaphor, not a Jewish one, but it's a very powerful motif that people welcome someone who comes from the outside into their midst. He's also a bit of a stranger. He's a bit different. And that's something that traditional Jews could find exotic and, and, and exhilarating, although at times annoying, because Herzl was himself not religiously observant. And when he first talked with the chief rabbi of Vienna about his Zionist plan, uh, it was uh, Christmas time and Herzl was decorating the family Christmas tree. The rabbi was upset and Herzl was nonplussed, didn't understand what the problem was. So Herzl's charisma was something that very much depended on how he was seen by his movement. And the last thing um, I wanna mention, in the third theme in the book, is how Herzl uh, appealed to the non-Jewish world. And this is where the constructed nature of charisma becomes important because not everybody was taken by Herzl. First of all, not all Jews were taken by Herzl. There were plenty of Jews who thought he was silly, embarrassing, assimilationist Jews who denied the concept of a Jewish nation, highly religious Jews who thought that the idea of a active movement to return Jews to Palestine was, was, was blasphemous. Socialist radical Jews who thought Zionism was a distraction from the real challenge, which was uh, the need to uh, organize a revolution against capitalism, which causes, among other things, anti-Semitism. There were lots of people who thought Herzl was silly and who were not taken by him in the Jewish world and in the non-Jewish world all the more so. Uh, when the New York Times first wrote about Herzl, they put the article about him in a section of the paper reserved for funny little stories of the day. So there was a little talk, a little a few paragraphs about Herzl as an odd man with a kind of an enthusiastic dream. And right after that came a story about a friendship in the Central Park menagerie between a rhinoceros and a cat. So that, that's how, how they viewed Herzl. But having said that, Herzl could have a, um, a great impact on those people in the international community who were open to this uh, slightly otherworldly uh, man with his ancient Semitic appearance. That is, if people were open to the premise of, of, of Herzl as a kind of latter-day prophet, they found him quite charismatically appealing. 
This is a man who managed uh, to meet with the uh, King of Italy, uh, the Pope, the German Kaiser, uh, the foreign minister, a colonial minister of the United Kingdom, the foreign minister and interior minister of Russia. This is a man who uh, was able to meet with and often impress great world leaders. He was able to do this in part because of his journalistic uh, credibility. He was, after all, the literary editor of the most influential newspaper in the German-speaking world, the Neue Freie Presse. That often got him in the door. But he was also an impressive figure. He spoke well uh, to the extent that people were either anti-Semites, he appealed to them because of the prospect of getting Jews out of Europe, but to the extent they were philo-Semites, he appealed to them as a kind of latter-day biblical, biblical figure. So Herzl could be quite charming uh, and quite engaging. Last but not least, he tried to offer world leaders something concrete, that the Jews would be loyal uh, servants of whatever regime established a protectorate in Palestine, be it Germany, as he tried to do without success, or Britain. And then in his uh, several meetings with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, he offered something totally different, that the Jews would be loyal subjects to the Ottoman Empire and would be able to raise funds to help pay off the uh, Ottoman Empire's considerable debt. So he offered different things to different people because Herzl was not only a journalist and not only a dreamer, he was also a statesman. And like all statesmen, he was a bit of an opportunist. And that is also a, uh, an aspect of great political leadership. So those are the three themes of the book. They all have something to do or another with charisma. And uh, with that, I'll stop and uh, turn it over to Alex. Eric, thanks so much for, for that uh, introduction and overview of the themes of the book. You, the, the strand that ran through your comments and runs through the book is this idea of charisma. So let me begin by asking a question about that. And we had some questions um, from the, the people in the seminar, Noit Banai and others about charisma. Um, one of the first things that, that, that strikes me about your um, description of the emergence of Herzl's charisma as something that is sort of co-created by him, but also in a particular context and the people that were struck by him as charismatic, is that um, the things that um, constructed Herzl as charismatic are precisely the factors that when we think of the emergence of Zionism, not Herzl as a person, but Zionism in general, so that there are factors in that. The breakdown of traditional structures of Jewish authority, the breakdown of the ghetto, assimilation, um, um, uh, breaking down of religious structures and so on. And, and these are the same things that, that make him um, charismatic in his particular context. Uh, one of the things that, that strikes me in your writing about Herzl, but frankly, in the way that many people write about him is, is the way that he's often compared to other people. Uh, you, in your own book, compare him to Churchill, to Disraeli, others compare him to Martin Luther King. Um, he himself compared himself to Charles Parnell, who was the... Um, late 19th century um, Irish uh, nationalist uh, politician. He compared himself to Henry Morton Stanley, the uh, African explorer, the sort of Indiana Jones kind of figure as well. And, and I, I'm wondering what you think that um, these kinds of comparisons did for people at the time, or for Herzl himself at the time, and also for those of us now thinking with historical hindsight, how, how does that help shape our understanding of him as, as historians and scholars? Well, it's a, great, it's a great question because there's what people are aware of at the time or what they think when they make these comparisons and what we might think after the fact. When Herzl writes, I, I'll, there's a line in his diary, he writes, I'll, I'll be the Parnell of the Jews. I, I think it was a flourish. But the interesting thing about Parnell is that he was a Protestant. So Parnell was actually one of these people who's associated with the elite of the, as it were, the colonizing, the oppressing force and it's precisely these people in the middle uh, who can often be great leaders. So Herzl is the somewhat the, the partially, I say partially assimilated because I, I don't like the word assimilationist to suggest someone who doesn't know he's Jewish and Herzl certainly knew he was Jewish. Um, so the comparison can be used as, as a flourish or it can have an analytical value. And I think when Herzl mentions Parnell, it's more of a flourish. Uh, Herzl also compares himself in a very uncertain sort of way to Shabbatai Tzvi, or he says, I'm different from Shabbatai Tzvi, the great false messiah of the 17th century. He writes, um, you know, I won't be like Shabbatai Tzvi, 
uh, because he was small and thought he was great, whereas I'm great. People th think I'm great, but I know I'm small. So comparisons can be, uh, you know, they can have an educational purpose, they can be a rhetorical flourish, or they can be genuinely, uh, uh, if rigorously applied, they can have academic value. So, for example, if we look at the difference between an established state and a national movement, we see that the established state or the anti-colonial or national movement need different kinds of leadership. So, if we look at the kind of Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States, that's one kind of leadership, a civil rights movement. Gandhi in India, a different kind of charismatic leadership, but still that's very different from the leadership that it takes to be an effective, say, president of the United States in the early 20th century. Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who was a charismatic in his own way, but inherited a whole set of institutions. He didn't have to build up from scratch. So what this means is that a truly great charismatic leader, if we're gonna look at Herzl in comparative perspective, has to not only have the charm and the work ethic and the ability to make people feel good about themselves, he also or she has to have um, organizational ability, has to have uh, the power to create really something out of nothing. That's what makes anti-colonial leaders or nationalist leaders in the 19th century in such a difficult, it puts them in such a difficult spot. Herzl ha had to create pretty much everything from scratch. Yes, there was a Zionist movement. You're totally right that these crises had predated him. They go back to the 18, uh, late 1870s, early 1880s. Herzl did not invent the Zionist movement. It existed before him, but it was very small and weak. And he created an institutional structure. He created a way of talking about Zionism. After all, the word Zionism didn't even exist until the early 1890s. And Herzl's the one who actually picked up the word and began to use it systematically, although it happened only after he turned to Jewish nationalism. He didn't even know the word Zionism when he was having that frenzied episode of self-discovery in 1895. So charismatics who are you know, anti-colonial or nationalist leaders, I think have a much greater burden than charismatics who become say presidents of the United States. The story that you have told so far is very much a European story. Uh, it couldn't happen without Vienna. And a, a couple of our participants have asked about the, the impact of Vienna and I would of course add the impact of Paris and the um, politics of Austria-Hungary and so on. Um, I'd be interested to hear you elaborate on the European context of this, but in addition, I, I want to ask you a, a, a sort of the a flip side of this, if you like, which was, is this in any way a Jewish story? Um, Gershom Shalom, um, many years after Herzl's death, talked about the explosive um, capacity of Jewish mythology and Jewish language. And it's certainly true that um, the messianic myth um, was used by Herzl himself and by others talking about Herzl. So please talk about the European context of this and if you have any reflections on whether this is in any way specifically Jewish. Herzl is, is quintessentially uh, European and he's unmistakably Jewish and we can't separate the two. You know, uh, Herzl's formative years, he's born and raised in Budapest. He moves to Vienna as an 18-year-old. Uh, he attends university in Vienna. He spends much of his working life in Vienna. His native languages are German and Hungarian. His French is flawless. He has a good command of ancient Greek and Latin. He never mastered English, although he was an Anglophile. And he spoke Italian well enough to converse with the King of Italy in Italian and then to write his diary entries in Italian to prove to himself and to his future readers that he knew Italian. So he's very much a cosmopolitan European. Herzl's formative journalistic years were in Paris. Between 1891 and 1895, he was his newspaper's Paris correspondent. Paris, as Walter Benjamin said, was the capital of the 19th century. This is where everything was happening, artistically, politically. And Herzl was in his element. And he loved being part of the political scene. He knew everybody. He knew Clemenceau, he knew Proust, he was, being a journalist, you get to meet a lot of people, and he was in the thick of it. Uh, so Herzl is, is very much quintessentially European. Unfortunately, part of that European civilization that he loves so much, the culture, the language, the way of life, is anti-Semitism. And to this day, there's debates about why is that Herzl turned uh, towards Jewish nationalism 
in the first half of the 1890s? Was it because of anti-Semitism in France from the Panama scandal all the way through the Dreyfus, uh, Dreyfus's arrest, his first trial, and then the penumbra uh, of uh, that uh, first trial known as the Dreyfus Affair that begins really in 1898 with the publication of Emile Zola's uh, Screed de Jacques. Is it because of anti-Semitism in France? Or is it because of anti-Semitism in Vienna, which had an avowedly anti-Semitic mayor, Karl Lueger, who was seated in, uh, in the mid 1890s. So Herzl is exposed to anti-Semitism everywhere. Well, lots of Jews are exposed to anti-Semitism at this time without becoming Zionists. So clearly there's something else going on inside of Herzl that makes him not only become a Zionist, but to devote his, devote his life to it. My own sense, and I'm not the only person to argue this, is that Vienna was more important to Herzl as a source of um, fear of anti-Semitism than Paris. Herzl actually does not mention Dreyfus in his diary until late 1896. Dreyfus does not show up in Herzl's private correspondence, at least that which has uh, survived. Herzl reported on the Dreyfus trial, the degradation of Dreyfus for his newspaper, but he reported about it in a very matter-of-fact way. One can say that he was exercising self-censorship as a journalist because he couldn't write about anguish uh, about Dreyfus uh, publicly, but in fact, privately, he doesn't seem to have written about it until the end of the 1890s, when he wrote an essay in which he said that the Dreyfus trial made him into a Zionist. Now, to get back to that adversarial versus hagiographic tension I mentioned earlier, there are some of the newer biographers who will say, well, Herzl was obviously lying. He's fabricating a story because the Dreyfus affair was world-renowned and it gave Zionism greater credibility. Well, that's possible, but it's also possible that he genuinely remembered it that way. We do this with memory. And there are other cases in Herzl's life where he conflated or separated things that are factually not true, but we do this with memory. The other possibility is that um, there was a great deal of negative pretrial publicity uh, about Dreyfus. It may have influenced him in certain ways that were not expressed in anything that he wrote. So I'm not saying he was fabricating. I'm saying that he remembered in a different way. The point is that whether it's Paris or Vienna, anti-Semitism is the dark underside of European civilization. And the answer for him is to create a Jewish homeland in which Jews will be safe in which they'll be able to live as Jews as they wish, religious or secular, or however they define it, uh, but there won't be anti-Semitism. And as he depicts in his novel, Old New Land in 1902, it will be an intensely and thoroughly European uh, society. One of the main characters in the book is a Palestinian Arab who speaks fluent German. Uh, Herzl even writes in his diary, in the new land, in our, in our old new land, we will have all the comforts of home, opera, beer, pretzels, cured meats. He wants to bring Europe to, to Palestine. So yes, he's very much a European who thinks that only by establishing a Jewish homeland in Eretz Israel and Palestine can Jews be truly European. So that's the first part. As far as the messianism goes, as I said, Herzl was aware of comparisons between him and Shabbat Tzvi. He was both elated and a bit concerned by the reception he received at times from crowds who, who greeted him with an enthusiasm uh, as one would greet the Messiah. I think it was the rabbi in Sofia, Bulgaria, who proclaimed that he was the Messiah. And when Herzl appeared at the first Zionist Congress, uh, there was 15 minutes of applause and cheering. Women fainted, men kissed his hand, and one, um, hard-bitten journalist could not prevent himself from, from shouting Yechi HaMelech, long live the king, meaning the king Messiah. So Herzl had this effect on, on people and he was very, very well aware of it, a bit ambivalent about it. Uh, but I think Herzl himself, he, I mean, he did see himself as a great leader of the Jews. He claims to have had a dream when he was a child that he met Moses and um, Moses takes him into the heavens and uh, the divine voice says, you know, is this the Messiah whom I have chosen? So Herzl claims to have dreamed that he was the Messiah when he was, you know, a young man. Whether he had that dream or not, I don't know. But the point is that this was part of his persona and it was part of the way he was perceived. I'd like to ask a couple of questions about Herzl's 
positions on, on Zionism and, and on other issues. Um, let's begin with um, Der Judenstadt. And I'm saying that in German, this is the title of his 1896 pamphlet, which uh, sets out, uh, it's what, I suppose it's his longest sustained publication on, on his, uh, how he imagined um, the future Jewish state to, to look like. Um, but I'm saying it in German because it's a difficult thing to translate. Um, one of our uh, participants asked a question about this, Max August. Is Der Judenstadt the Jewish state? Is it the state of the Jews? Mm -hmm. If it means the Jewish state, in what sense Jewish? And um, we see in your, in your book that Herzl's positions on this change constantly. Is it going to be some kind of aristocratic colony? Is it going to be what he called a democratic cooperative commonwealth? Um, he even invented a word for this, mutualism. Um, I don't know if he coined that. Or I've, not, I've not seen it elsewhere. And so he had all of these like very almost disparate views, some of them um, verging on uh, socialism, some of them a lot more aristocratic, some of them more um, colonialist, some of them a lot more infused. Could you please talk about um, his view on what um, the Jewish colony would look like? Um, it's an interesting question about language because there's two terms that are probably more important than any other for understanding Herzl Zionism, Central European Zionism, and they are ambiguous. One is, is Judenstaat, the other is Judentum. Mm -hmm. So Judenstaat, does it mean a Jewish state, a state that is religiously Jewish, a state that has a Jewish character, or a state in which a lot of Jews live, you know, a state of Jews. But I think that fundamentally gets to the tension within the word Judentum. Because does the word Judentum mean Judaism as a religion, or does it mean Jewry, which is a kind of an, it's an awkward word we don't use a whole lot anymore, you know, J-E-W-R-Y, Jewry, Jews as a collective. So Herzl wrote a famous essay called Judentum, which is often mistranslated as Judaism. And when Herzl writes that the return of Jews to Zion is a return to Judentum, he's not saying that they all need to become religious. Herzl has been uh, strongly misread by some national religious uh, Zionists who see in his writing on Judentum a kind of a, a plea for, a, for a, a religiously inflected polity, but that's not what he's about at all. Herzl himself was not observant. Uh, he did learn Hebrew as a child and he had some rudimentary Jewish education. He didn't even, so far as we can tell, have a bar mitzvah, but that's mainly because there was a cholera epidemic at the time. We know that he attended synagogue from time to time as a child. He writes about it, going to synagogue with his father. But he did not have any Jewish textual literacy. He did not, he was not observant. He, during that frenzied episode I mentioned in 1895, he went to synagogue in Paris of a Friday evening. And he clearly, from what he writes, he has not been to synagogue in a very long time. And he, he wrote about Judaism a fair amount during his nine, 10 years of Zionist, uh, nine years of Zionist activity. Um, and he writes about it in a respectful way, but it's clearly a respect from a distance. So in Old New Land, the temple has been rebuilt, but it's not going to be a seat of sacrificial offering. It's sort of like the Stephansdom in, in Vienna. It is a, an aesthetic marvel and it's a symbol of, 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 national, of national identity. I forget where it is. I think it's in the Jewish state where he writes that in our Jewish state, in the towns and villages of our Jewish states, the steeples of our synagogues will be visible from, from afar. So he's obviously making a Christian sort of reference there. Uh, Judaism for him is a source of comfort. It's a kind of anchor. Uh, there is a scene in his novel, Old New Land, that takes place during Friday night religious services. That's a very important scene. His novel is filled with references to God. But this is not unusual for a secularizing individual in upper middle class circles in fin de siècle, Western and Central Europe. They don't get rid of religion altogether, but it's not, it's not a central part of their lives. So I, I think this is what Herzl means by Judentum. It's really the Jews as a people, as he says, we are a people, one people. Uh, Judentum is an aspect of that peoplehood. And people will observe their religion in different, in, in different levels. And he's not judgmental about that. He's not anti-clerical in the sense that some of the Eastern European secular Zionists were. 
because he wants to have an alliance with Orthodox, uh, with Orthodox rabbis. So he's not anti-clerical, but he's not himself religious. And that helps explain then what we mean by Judenstadt. It is not going to be a state, it's not gonna be a theocracy. He writes explicitly, we will keep the rabbis in their synagogues as we will keep the army officers in their barracks. Uh, Judenstadt is a state in which Jews will live their lives as Jews, as they wish to, without compulsion either external or internal. I'd like to ask you now about a series of terms, Eurocentrism, colonialism, imperialism, Orientalism. Um, for those who are watching who don't know this, Professor Penslar has written one of the most cogent and important pieces on um, the relationship between Zionism and colonialism, which I recommend that everybody to take a look at. And um, it's a very fraught topic. Um, so I, I'll ask you this um, both uh, I, in terms of Herzl's own life, but also in, the, in terms of the way, um, the uses to which Herzl's life has been put, uh, which is to say that Herzl, on the one hand, um, seems to have um, preached sort of tolerance and cosmopolitanism and so on. But he also unquestionably had this rather paternalistic Eurocentric streak in him, which um, especially when it came to Africa, um, was, uh, was, was very much this sort of oriental um, perspective on non-European peoples. Um, what then was Herzl's perspective on the Middle East, on Arab-Palestinians, um, when, when he was writing about Zionism? What did he think, um, if, if, if indeed there came to be a Jewish homeland in Eretz Israel or in somewhere in Africa or wherever it may be, what would happen to the other people who were living there? Um, and then in terms of the way to which this uh, Herzl's positions um, have been put, often when people talk about Herzl's views on these things, and they talk about them as a kind of proxy for talking about Zionism and the state of Israel itself. You see Herzl was a, uh, had this Orientalist and therefore implicit state of Israel does. So I'd love to hear your perspective on those two things. Those are very important questions. They're probably the most controversial questions that I deal with in the book. And uh, maybe the easiest way to answer it is simply to refer to the language that Herzl himself used explicitly, unapologetically, and uh, at the time, in the late 1800s, beginning of the 20th century. Herzl saw nothing but uh, glory in associating Zionism with what he considered to be the world historical mission of the Western powers to civilize the world. And he was interested in colonialism as an armchair observer. Uh, the Austrian Hungarian Empire did not have colonies, but his newspaper, which he was literary editor, regularly published stories about colonial science and medicine and exploration. And he considered this to be something that was beneficial. Herzl wrote several long journalistic pieces. They're called in French feuilleton or like literary essays about Africa and about uh, native peoples in Africa who were brought to Europe uh, to uh, be exhibited for um, Viennese or Parisians or people in Brussels or whatever to, uh, for, for their enjoyment. This was something called a Völkerschau in German. In French, it was called a zoo humain or a human zoo in, in, in English. Uh, there's a whole literature about this phenomenon in which natives were not kidnapped or, or anything like that. They signed contracts and they were paid to go from wherever it was in Africa or um, the Aleutian Islands or wherever it was and to perform for an audience. So it was a kind of a colonialist spectacle. Herzl wrote about this without shame, without embarrassment. He considered it very important for Europeans to learn about these people whom he considered to be uh, not genetically or racially inferior, but culturally inferior. And he believed that time and European beneficent influence would bring about um, an improvement of, 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 of their situation. Now, we look upon this today as paternalistic, condescending, disrespectful. Uh, in his age, it was considered to be a form of progressive thought. Regarding Arabs, Herzl's thinking was particularly odd because it was bifurcated. When Herzl went to Egypt, he um, met with and he was aware of young Egyptian men who were anti-colonialists and who he writes in his diary, these people could bring about the end of the British Empire. This is after he has a very unsatisfying meeting with Lord, uh, with Lord Cromer, uh, the Viceroy of Egypt. He's, he's not at all, he doesn't like this man very much. So I think he was, there was a part of him that was happy to see 
in these young Egyptian men, an anti-colonial um, movement of Borning. On the other hand, he never really deals with Palestinian Arab feelings or opposition to Zionism. Remember that Herzl went to Palestine only once in his life. He spent 10 days there. And he only went because the Kaiser of Germany told him to meet him there so that they could talk about a German protector in Palestine. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone. He saw very little of Palestine. Uh, and when he was there, he wrote about Arabs in the, a highly cursory way. He wrote about villages neglected, quote, in Arab fashion, end quote. Uh, so there's, there's very little engagement. There's certainly no engagement with Arabs as in Palestine as a collective, as a group, uh, with, with a will and desire of their own. Early in his Zionist career, he received correspondence from a former mayor of Jerusalem, uh, Mohammed uh, Dia al-Halidi, who in a very respectful letter writes to Herzl and uh, expresses sympathy for Jewish suffering, acknowledgement of Jewish connections with the Holy Land, but reminds Herzl that there are hundreds of millions of Muslims in the world, and that there is a population of Arabs in Palestine, and that they are not going to welcome a massive intrusion of Jews into the land. And it's really a very respectful, but also a very firm letter. And Herzl writes back, essentially, don't worry, we will bring nothing but technological benefit to the population and they will welcome us in time. So it's just, they're talking across purposes. Now, was Herzl being deceitful, deceptive? Did he harbor a plan to expel the Palestinian Arabs or to crush their national desires? Or was he simply oblivious because he had wedded himself to an ideological program that was the very center of his life? And this is what he is living for after his enthusiastic or frenzied moment in 1895, and he's not gonna let anything stand in his way. Well, there's two ways of answering that question, and I deal with them in the book. When he was in that frenzied state in 1895, there's two sentences in his diary where he writes that the um, impoverished population, native population of a future Jewish state will be sent away. And then he moves on to another topic. So now this, a couple of lines in the diary is often referred to by critics of Zionism in Israel as a sign that the Zionist movement planned from the very beginning to um, expel Palestinians from the country. Um, I don't read it that way because he wrote a lot of things in that diary entry in 1895 that he never had any intention of realizing. But having said that, uh, when Herzl was somewhat older and he was writing in a more calm and sane way about colonization of a future Jewish state. He wanted a colonization company to have the right to uh, practice eminent domain, to expropriate territory, to settle people who are on the land somewhere else, because this is what states do. So I don't think Herzl planned to simply summarily uh, deport all of the Palestinian population, but he felt that the Jews would have the right as a state power to engage in the sort of practices of eminent domain and resettlement that are not that far off from what uh, well, state practice in general has been. Uh, but it can certainly make us uncomfortable that he felt that Europeans had a right to determine where non-Europeans would live, that they would simply pick them up and move them somewhere else. So Herzl is very much a product of his time this way. And how much emphasis we put on this really depends on how much emphasis we place on, let's say, that diary entry from 1895 and more measured things he writes later on in his, in his life. And I just want to finish with his novel, uh, Old New Land, which is a fantasy of complete peace between Jews and the world, including, including Arabs. And there's a Palestinian character in the novel. I mentioned him, the Germanophone uh, Palestinian uh, Rashid Bey. He's a cardboard character, like all the characters in the book. Uh, he mimics the kind of Western colonialist mantra that the West has brought technological benefit to his people. I think it's sincere. Uh, it's not a very good novel, but Herzl cared about it and loved it and spent three years writing it. And I think he actually, I think he believed in what he was writing in that book. So my own sense is that Herzl's views were indeed, as you said, quite contradictory. They change over time. In general, there's a big difference between the Herzl of 1895-96 and the Herzl of 1902-1903, just before his death in 1904. But he was 
despite it all. He was very much a man of the West. He was very much a man who believed in Western technological and cultural superiority. In our closing uh, seven or eight minutes, uh, let's cast our gaze forward a little bit and, start, and uh, end by thinking about Herzl's legacy. A number of people have asked questions about this. Um, so I have a, a couple of questions about this and, and I'll ask them together and, and perhaps we'll, we'll um, wind down with this. Um, first of all, Herzl, obviously taken to be one of the most important founders of the Zionist movement, um, and yet died long before uh, I, Zionism became a, a serious practical proposition. It's true that in 1897, he famously wrote in his diary that, that he, today I have founded the Jewish state, maybe in five years, maybe in 50, um, and so on. And that's been taken by many as some kind of um, prophetic uh, vision. On the other hand, um, it wasn't until many years after his death that there was even the Balfour Declaration, and not until decades after that, the State of Israel was founded. So I guess the question there is, how important really was Herzl um, for the Zionist movement? Maybe not just in the 1890s, but in the 20th century, the 21st century. Um, that's the first uh, question. And the second one is, is really about Herzl, the image of Herzl in, in Israel today. And many people have asked questions about this from, from different angles. Um, so, some of the angles are, you know, distilled down to something like, what would Herzl say about Israel today in terms of Israel? Um, is Israeli culture, Israeli society, the relationship between Israel and, um, and, and Palestinians and so on. Um, but obviously there are many, many ways to take that question and, and I'll turn it to you to, to answer it. It's a good question about uh, how important was Herzl because he was not the one who obtained great power recognition of the Jewish claim to Palestine. That honor goes to Heim Weizmann during World War I. Uh, the Zionist movement in the late 19th century was definitely in the doldrums, and Herzl created something from scratch. He created institutions that survived him. And that's the odd thing about him as a charismatic. It gets back also to something about the special demands placed on leaders of early nationalist and anti-colonial movements. He created a proto-government in the Zionist organization. He created the Zionist bank and land purchase organizations. And so part of it is that he had an institutional legacy that survived him. Part of it is his journalistic legacy, his pamphlet, Der Judenstaat, uh, his Zionist writings, the image of his face. Uh, Herzl became a meme. He became a symbol for a national movement that inspired scores of thousands, even more, uh, of people in the world in the early 20th century. It's very hard to imagine the Zionist movement uh, without this charismatic figure whose charisma is actually perpetuated through imagery and through stories uh, told about him. So I think just as he captured something in the moment where he spoke to the needs of Jews in his era, he has continued or he continued to exert a, a, a charismatic authority beyond the grave. Um, I don't know what would have happened to the Zionist movement if it had gone to this trough, a kind of you know deep extended decline in the 1890s, early 1900s, would Chaim Weizmann have appeared from nowhere and secured the Balfour Declaration anyway? Maybe. But Herzl clearly gave the Jewish world something that lasted long beyond his death. As far as the other question about the legacy of Herzl, uh, Herzl himself created his own legacy in a way by cultivating his image, by writing the texts he did, even by writing diaries that he wrote would be published someday so that people would read them and appreciate how much he had suffered. So he kind of creates a legacy for himself, but people read that legacy in different ways. Uh, the state of Israel essentially um, used him instrumentally to symbolize that all of Herzl's dreams and aspirations were realized in the creation of the state of Israel. And there is a play, it's not playing in Israel anymore, but it was playing last year, about Herzl's bones being um, uh, disinterred from uh, Vienna and then sent to, to Israel for reburial. But Herzl actually comes alive when they dig up his coffin in Vienna and he tells the Israeli delegation that's come to take his, his bones, you know, his vision of what the Jewish state should be like and they realize it's not, not anywhere remotely like what the state of Israel is really like. And they cable Ben Gurion, they ask him, what should we do? Herzl's come back to life and he's saying all these things that are different from what the state of Israel is. 
and Ben Gurion cables back, bring his bones back to the state of Israel. So they basically put him back in the coffin. Uh, so Herzl could be used by the state of Israel as a symbol that everything he stood for had been realized. To this day, he's used by different uh, different people in different ways. You know, uh, there's the Zionist left, which or the post-Zionist left, which sees Herzl as a liberal, cosmopolitan, and who would stand for their values of a state of Israel that is a state of all of its citizens. There is, however, a right wing rereading of Herzl. Uh, I mentioned the religious rereading of Herzl earlier. There's also the view that he was a, a realist, capital R, who understood the dangers of anti-Semitism, <clears throat> the need for Jews to exercise political uh, sovereignty in their own state. And the right wing NGO, Im Tirtzu, takes its name from the Hebrew translation of the epigram to Herzl's novel, Old New Land, if you wish it, Im Tirtzu, or if you will it, it is not a fairy tale. So for them, Herzl is about power politics and, and realism. Now, I do think that the right wing and the religious readings of Herzl are more far-fetched than the left wing readings of Herzl. But what they both do <clears throat> is they fail to understand that great leadership, charisma, the life of an individual are indeed historically situated. Herzl was a product of an era in which I think he would be profoundly uncomfortable with many of the ways he's being read today. Herzl would not understand the world of 2020, even though he predicted the future. I think he would be very unhappy with many aspects of the state of Israel today. But more important, much of it would be simply beyond his capacity to understand. He was a product of, of his era. And maybe that's the difference between the way a historian reads the life of a great leader and the way that a journalist or maybe a political science reads that life, a scientist reads that life. Because I read it as a study in the constructed nature of his charisma in his time and place. And then I'm interested in why, again, the image lives on in certain ways up to our own day. But the Herzl of 2020, the image of Herzl today is not the Herzl of 1900. It's a very different thing. Well, I'm glad to say that even though we don't have Herzl in the year 2020, we do have your biography of Herzl. Um, and um, it remains only for me to thank, first of all, all the participants that joined us online for this seminar. And thank you so much to Professor Penzler. And we all look forward uh, to reading Theodor Herzl, the charismatic leader from Yale University Press. Thank you, everybody. Alex, thank you.